Uh, my name is David Augustine and I am an ecologist with the USDA's Agricultural Research Service stationed here in Fort Collins. I think almost all the students I talk to in natural resource management tell me I just want to be outside and that really is how I got started in this career. I just love being outdoors and wanted a career that involved interacting with the outdoors. But uh, there are a couple things that led me to this career spe more specifically. One, as a middle school and high school student I was actually on an ecology team where we competed in terms of our ecological knowledge. Uh, it was a program through the Army Corps of Engineer. And then once I went to college, I became very interested in uh, ecosystem science and ecology in general. I think the thing that always made me most interested about ecology was the way energy flowed through ecosystems, and in particular, how sunlight could actually become meat for us. And so that's how I ended up studying ungulates, both wild and domestic ungulates for most of my career. So broadly speaking, my current research is focused around the general idea of how do we both produce uh, food for humanity and conserve biodiversity in agricultural ecosystems, and specifically in rangelands. How can we manage livestock in rangelands in a way that both increases or improves our, the productivity of livestock while also trying to sustain biodiversity in these systems? This collaborative work that I've been doing over the past few years, working directly with a group of ranchers, conservation organizations, and land management agency personnel. And, Working on a personal level with people has really been something new for me instead of just hiding in a corner in my office analyzing data. I've really just enjoyed the opportunity to work with people and discuss science with others who look at it from different perspectives. So that has been, I think, one of the more rewarding parts of my career in recent years. Thank you all for coming and welcome to the next installment of the 2018 Spring Seminar series hosted by the Department of Forest and Rangeland Stewardship within the Warner College of Natural Resources here at Colorado State University. My name is Daniel Beveridge. I'm a master's student in natural resources stewardship with a concentration in forest sciences. And I'm here to introduce our speaker, Dr. David Augustine. He is an ecologist with the Rangeland Resources Research Unit within the USDA's Agricultural Research Service. Yeah. hosted here in Fort Collins. One, two, three, um, four, five, six, seven. His research interests focus on the influence of herbivores on the structure, function, and diversity of ecosystems. Dr. Augustine got his MS degree uh, in wildlife conservation from the University of Minnesota and his PhD in biology from Syracuse University. Uh, current major focus of his research in the Great Plains is quantifying trade-offs and synergies among livestock, li excuse me, livestock production and biodiversity conservation. Please welcome me in joining, um, join me in welcoming <laughs> Dr. David Augustine. Oh. Thank you, Dr. Thanks. thanks. Okay, great, thanks. Well, thanks to Troy for putting me up to giving this seminar. And um, what I'm gonna be talking about is an effort I've been engaged in for the past six years. It's a collaborative effort, includes this department, we've been working very closely with Maria Fernandez Jimenez on this effort, and uh, apparently she's in DC. I called her up to get some input on the talk, and I was like, oh, I'm really impressed that you can give a departmental seminar while you're in DC. But um, so she's been a big part of this, and I'm, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is on the social side and the collaborative side of things is work that Maria has been leading. And then I'm, I'm more of an ecologist that likes to just look at data and measure things that don't involve humans. And so I'll, I'll also talk today about the uh, biophysical aspects of the work we've been doing and, and the ecological results. Um, just to give a credit to some of my collaborators, so from ARS, Justin Derner is our research leader and he's the one that really initiated this effort that I'll talk about. Uh, Lauren Prensky helps me with some of the vegetation work. And then Haley Wilmer is a postdoc with our research now, our research unit now, and she got her PhD working on this project here in this department. So um, there's hope for the graduate students that are here. And uh, she's been really a leader in this effort for the past several years in terms of the social science. And then, again, we're working with Maria in this department. I have Kristen Davis, Cam Aldridge, Amber Carver, Michael Wonder, and Susan Scoggin are all on the, are, they're all wildlife folks working on the avian side of things. And then David Brisky from Texas A&M University has also been helping us with uh, both the grazing research and the, the social side of things. So what we've been trying to do 
is to look at how we can use collaborative adaptive management to sustain multiple ecosystem services and rangeland ecosystems, focusing uh, specifically on eastern Colorado. And the motivating factor for this effort, one of the big motivating issues is a disconnect that's existed in rangeland science uh, between manager experience and scientific research. It's been there for at least a half century now in terms of the role of rotational grazing management and the outcomes that it generates in rangelands. So uh, in 2011, uh, this SEEP report was produced. Hopefully, if you're a range student in, in this department, you're aware of this report because I think it was a really important publication that reviewed all of the research that's been done uh, scientifically on rotational grazing and discussed how there's really very little evidence from the scientific literature that rotational grazing in any form produces uh, desired outcomes in terms of vegetation or animal performance in rangelands. But of course, we do have a huge body of evidence that comes from uh, consulting groups and agencies that work with ranchers and ranchers themselves coming in and saying, well, I've been doing this type of management and I feel that it's really producing outcomes that I want on my land. So that's the disconnect that we're really interested in. Uh, the, the problem with this disconnect is that in NRC, we have NRCS providing a, a lot of taxpayer dollars in terms of incentives to ranchers to engage in various forms of adaptive, rotational, multi-paddock management, whatever you want to call it. We are using a lot of tax dollars to promote this management and we don't have a lot of scientific evidence to support that we're generating outcomes with those dollars that we actually want. So this is the, the main issue we wanted to try to address. Another thing that I've been really interested in in the Western Great Plains is declining grassland bird populations. Um, I work a lot with the national grasslands and on all the national grasslands from Montana down to New Mexico, uh, most of the species of conservation concern are birds, grassland birds. And uh, birds that breed in the Great Plains have been identified as one of the most rapidly declining guilds of birds in North America. And they, they've been declining pretty steadily, certain species, uh, since at least the 1960s. So it's been a long-term decline. And then another thing we wanted to focus on is lack of stakeholder involvement in the scientific process. This was identified in the SEEP report, and of course this is one of the things that Maria Fernandez Jimenez focuses on. How do we engage people more actively in science? And I know when I was a graduate student, both my master's and my PhD, I was like, I was in a applied natural resource management. You go to an agency, you get some funding, they have a problem, I go back to my department and do research for two or three years and then write a couple papers and come back with some answer for them. And there's not a lot of that back and forth involvement. So that's the idea here that we have here in the university we are, we're this science factory that's supposed to just produce a science for people to pick up and use. And of course that's really been criticized as a effective way of communicating with people. So um, in terms of what I think a collaborative adaptive management is, I, would, I saw that Tony Chang gave a talk here on this in this se session um, several weeks ago. I think I have the same definition that he does. Um, it, we want to integrate experimentation into the design and implementation of natural resource management. And so that's the adaptive management part. We're trying to, the capital A, capital M adaptive management is really trying to have experimentation as part of it. And then um, the collaborative part is we're trying to involve multiple stakeholders and also draw on all types of knowledge, not just science, but also um, experiential knowledge. So this project that we've been running is done at the Central Plains Experimental Range shown in brown up here. It's on the western side of Pawnee National Grassland, about an hour's drive from here. And the experimental range was created at the same time as Pawnee National Grassland, and it's a property that my research group uh, owns and manages. And then um, we work closely with the Crow Valley Livestock Cooperative. This is a group of about 50 ranchers that graze the l entire landscape shown in this, in this map. Um, you know, the, the white here is their private lands, but they also graze on the purple, which is the state lands, the green, which is managed by the Forest Service, and they also provide all the cattle that we use on the experimental station. So what we did in 2012 in response to this SEEP publication, we brought together uh, 11 member stakeholder group that met out at the Central Plains Experimental Range. We had four ranchers, all of whom are from the Crow Valley Livestock Cooperative. 
Uh, we brought in three, re three members that were representatives from conservation groups, the Nature Conservancy, Environmental Defense Fund, and Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. And then uh, one representative each from these four land management agencies. NRCS, Forest Service, who manages the national grasslands, uh, CSU Extension, and the Colorado State Land Board. And uh, there's a, quite a bit of rangeland in eastern Colorado that's managed by the Colorado State Land Board. And so what we did is we said, we're gonna give you guys your own ranch. We're gonna give you a chunk of land at the Central Plains Experimental Range, and you can manage it however you want for whatever you want, but you have to agree what you want on from that land, and you have to agree on how to manage it. <laughs> and then uh, we said, we're gonna take another piece of land next to it, and we're gonna manage it using traditional approach, that is how allotments are typically managed on Pawnee National Grassland. We gave them some sideboards. So we said, you know, it's just, you're only gonna be allowed to graze from like May to October, typical grazing season for public lands, and you're only gonna be able to use steers. So yearling steers, because we don't wanna deal with cow-calf pairs and steers are much easier to, for us to measure the beef production rates. But aside from that, you can do what you want. So I'll show you, uh, we brought them together. The first thing we did was we had a two-day workshop that they all participated in, in which we asked them to define the goals and objectives. What do you want from this piece of land that you're gonna get to manage? And this is what they agreed on as a group. A lot of them were apprehensive about this, this, pro this activity because they're working with people who have very different perspectives on rangelands. Uh, but the outcome of it and during it was really not contentious. Everybody agreed very readily on what they wanted from the land. They wanted to manage it to pass it on to future generations, both economically and ecologically. They set some vegetation goals. We were in the, in 2012, we were in a dry spell. If those of you who remember Eastern Colorado at that time is pretty bad drought. So uh, cool season grasses, C3 perennial grasses were relatively rare on the landscape at the time and one of the major goals of everybody involved was to increase the percentage of cool season grasses uh, relative to the C4 short grasses. They wanted to increase variation in vegetation structure, so increase heterogeneity in, in, in structure on the landscape. This was mostly brought up by the conservation organizations and I think the ranchers just agreed because they were like, yeah, well, that sounds good. And then um, they wanted to increase the abundance of some shrubs. And then profitable ranching operations, of course, you know, the desire was there on all sides to maintain or increase animal weight gains. And a major goal of the livestock producers was to increase drought resilience on the landscape, being able to get their cat, a, a, a fixed cattle herd all the way through a growing season, even when we hit a drought. And then on the wildlife side, we had specific goals that were developed for various species based on um, their degree of conservation concern. And we we're going through a drought, so some of these species that breed in shorter structure vegetation, they weren't so concerned about, let's at least maintain them. But pop, uh, species that breed in taller structure, taller uh, uh, grasses, um, we wanna increase their populations. We did argue a lot. The only thing that was contentious that we argued a lot about was prairie dogs. And so we solved that by just saying, we're gonna leave them out of this experiment. That is another whole issue in, in rangeland management that I won't address today. Um, and then these collaborative learning goals were not initially set. This is, they, those were developed by the group later in the experiment. After we'd gotten to know each other, we're in year three of the experiment. They said, we need specific written goals for learning in addition to just generating um, outcomes uh, for vegetation, wildlife, and livestock. So here's what they decided, and then here's what we gave them. So uh, outlines, this is the experimental range. We took 10 square miles and we did it in a block design. So each of the 10 square miles is divided into two half section pastures. They're paired based on soils and topography. And then all the yellow pastures are managed using this traditional approach, a moderate season long stocking at low stock density. And what I mean there is take all the cattle that would be assigned to those yellow pastures, you just divide them evenly across the landscape. So 10 different herds that are equivalent to a moderate stocking rate in each of the 10 pastures. And we knew that the uh, stakeholder group had a lot of people in it that were interested in more how do you move cattle on the landscape to achieve outcomes. So we said you can move them any way you want. And then in 2013, so this was subsequent meetings after the original one to set the objectives, they developed an adaptive management plan for this property and 
What they eventually arrived on in terms of the strategy that they would use to try to achieve their goals, one herd of 220 steers at the outset. Um, they were allowed to change that in subsequent years up or down, however they wanted, but at the outset we'd start with a recommended moderate stocking rate in the first year. And they were going to put them all together in one herd. They would plan each year to rest two of the ten pastures and then rotate the cattle through the remaining eight or so. But the exact uh, pattern of movement, the sequence and timing of it would be um, varied depending on the weather in particular, how much precipitation and when we get it. It would depend on forage biomass, which we measure wake. We get weekly estimates to decide how rapidly it's being depleted in whatever pasture the cattle are moving. And then uh, also based on trying to time grazing in a particular pasture based on its balance of C3 versus C4 grasses. So that's the species composition part. Okay, so I should put that. So. Um, the blue pastures here, again, each year they pick two of them that they're going to plan for rest, and then the cattle are planned for grazing through the remainder. Um, they also, in 2013, prior to starting the, uh, the treatments, they developed a monitoring plan. So these are all the things that we measure. So one thing I would say, I'm going to talk here today both about the ecological outcomes and kind of the, the social, out, you know, the process of applying collaborative management in this context. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons that collaborative adaptive management in the literature is proposed to often fail is because it's time consuming and because we often don't have resources for adequate monitoring to answer questions. So one of the things we've done in this project is to take that away. We have totally adequate resources. No one is ever going to have more resources than this project to monitor outcomes. We monitor almost everything. Uh, we have GPS collars on the cattle. Uh, we measure their diet composition. We collect fecal samples every Friday. We look at their uh, diet distribution. We have hundreds of permanent transects where we monitor vegetation. Uh, we have multiple graduate students measuring grassland bird responses. So we're measuring all these things. And then uh, we even have started some soil work. None, none of the stakeholders said they were interested in soil carbon sequestration as an outcome, but we added it as scientists because we figured we could get a couple papers out of it. So. These are all the things we're measuring, and I think one of the things that's interesting about this effort is we can't blame inadequate data or inadequate monitoring in this instance for CAM not being successful. Okay, so this is what we did up until 2014. A uh, couple meetings per year. Each of the white rows in this table shows you a meeting that we had with the stakeholders. I just want to illustrate how often we interact with them. And then a gray row shows you a growing season. So uh, in the 2013 growing season, we applied the traditional management to all 20 pastures and collected pre-treatment baseline measurements. And then in 2014, we implemented our first year of treatments. So we've been doing this for four years now, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And uh, this is just an example. In 2014, we had reasonable precipitation. Uh, they ended up, based on the vegetation conditions, they ended up rotating through these seven pastures, and we rested three of them. In other years, 2015, we had such tremendous forage production. It was a really wet year. We rested six of the pastures and only had to graze four of them. Most years, we're resting two or three pastures. And over time, um, we're now at a point where we're, we, 2015 we met three times. Um, now we're at a point where we actually meet five times a year with the stakeholders. Um, I just want to illustrate that it's really been accelerating over time. I think if we had asked these stakeholders to join us in a project that they were going to have to commit to meeting five times a year, no one would have agreed. So originally we asked them, could you commit to two meetings a year and you get to dis make all the decisions on how to manage this piece of land? And they said, that sounds great. Uh, but over time they've learned that this is a very time-consuming process, making decisions as a group of 11 people. And um, they've, each year they've asked for more meetings. So that's been nice that they're asking for it instead of us saying, you have to do this. Okay, so I'm just going to go through some of the ecological results that we've seen so far. In terms of how successful has this management been? So the upside, um, first of all, we have increased variation in grazing intensity among pastures, very clearly. We have, every year we have some that are not grazed at all, some that are grazed very intensively as compared to the traditional regime that are all moderately grazed. And this has increased, or this has led to us achieving our vegetation heterogeneity goal. 
Um, this is a box, two box plots just showing variability in vegetation height among the 10 pastures in each of the two treatments. So in the traditional, most of the pastures are near the mean. We've got one outlier that's a little bit tall and one that's a little bit short. Uh, but under the CARM treatment, we have succeeded in really increasing the range of variability among pastures, in particular generating pastures each year that have taller residual vegetation that's left behind. And then the one success we've had on the bird side is with the grasshopper sparrows. So this is a species that nests in very dense, continuous grass canopy, tall grass canopies that are usually provided by these C3 species that were fairly rare at the beginning of the experiment. And what we've shown here is that in both 2015 and 2016, these orange bars are showing the density of grasshopper sparrows in pastures that were rested in the previous year. The blue bars are showing pastures that were grazed by the CARM herd in the previous year, and then the gray is pastures that were grazed traditionally in the previous year. So where we, pastures that we don't graze at all and leave behind, we get really uh, large increases, a double density, and doubling the density in 2015, and almost tripling it in 2016. So this is uh, generating one of our desired outcomes. We're creating more heterogeneity on the landscape in terms of that tall end of the structural gradient, and one of the species of conservation concern, at least, is responding. Um, another upside is that each a year we've been able to rest two to three pastures. And this has really led to some discussions with the stakeholders about how much vegetation are we really carrying over, ungrazed vegetation are we carrying over into the next year, and how much should that influence our change in stocking rate for the next year. And so uh, we collectively, during our meetings, we collectively developed a forage calculator. It's just an Excel file with a bunch of spreadsheets, but we have uh, calculations of, of productivity for each of the 10 pastures and how much we're leaving behind. And that led to some very detailed discussions about what's the right stocking rate here? Should we be increasing it or decreasing it? And so the one nice thing I've seen is that every year in the experiment, we've increased the stocking rate. And it's been a consensus decision. I think that outside of a CAM type of framework, most of these people, both from the agencies and the conservation organizations, would not have readily agreed to such an increase. But when you have these discussions, they were all like, yeah, we need to increase the stocking rate. And we've done that for four years in a row. We're now 30% above the NRCS recommended stocking rate. The trade-off, however, the big downside that we've seen is in terms of animal weight gains, the per head weight gains of the steers. Uh, so. This is four years. Uh, black is weight gains by the CARM animals, and uh, gray is the weight gain by the traditionally managed animals. And the first year, we were kind of surprised as a group. I, I expected a small decrease because we're putting them in a big herd and they're grazing in a more crowded environment, but I really didn't think it was going to be much. There were stakeholders who insisted that there would be no decrease at all. And there were even one rancher that thought there would be a big decrease. So we had a diversity of opinions of about hypotheses at the beginning. But now we have this. Um, and let me put up the percentages. So the first two years, we got a 16% decline in animal performance with the rotational grazing. And that's big from a financial perspective. I don't want to take a 16% cut in my salary. So. Uh, you know, th these are the, the four ranchers here. These are the, their cattle. So, you know, this was a, a real issue in terms of how are we going to change that. We have made each year over the winter, we've met as a group and made progressive changes to the details of how we move the cattle based on vegetation conditions. And this is looked at as a, as a bit of success. So we seem to have narrowed that gap a little bit in years three and four because of the adapt small adaptive changes we made, but we didn't make any major changes to the stocking density. And uh, the other issue that we faced in terms of how do you change your management over time in response to the results that are coming in is there's a lot of uncertainty. So the biggest one we faced is that uh, so each year we're resting 20, 20 to 60% of the landscape, and a lot of the stakeholders have the idea that this is not, may, may not be a real benefit for us in average to wet years. So the four years we've had so far, we've had two wet years and two average years, but we haven't hit a drought yet. And many of them are, are really interested in the question of are we increasing the capacity to sustain cattle through drought? And they would like to see what happens here. So that has that really influenced decision making on whether to change 
the management strategy. Another issue has been western wheatgrass densities. This was our primary objective on the vegetation side. Everybody wants this species to increase. It provides habitat for some of the birds and it increases the productivity of your rangeland and it's a palatable grass. Um, there are many of the hypotheses surrounding how rotational grazing can benefit rangelands would, are hypotheses that pertain to species like this increasing. So we expect it if, if rotational grazing is working in a particular way uh, as hypothesized by some of the uh, stakeholders, we should see increases in western wheatgrass density in terms of what we're doing. And this should eventually give us future benefits that we're just not seeing in the short term. Um, I'm going to go to here. So uh, when I present things to the stakeholders, they don't like graphs. So I try to use maps. Um, they don't really don't like statistics. Um, this is our, these are, uh, the size of each circle shows you the density of western wheatgrass in these pastures based on our pre-treatment measurements in 2013 across three different soil types. So loamy soils in blue, sandy soils in yellow, and saline soils in red. So this is where we are in 2017. So that's where we were in 2013, this is where we are in 2017. So hopefully what you saw there is it went up. We got a big increase in western wheatgrass over the past four years, but did the, our management contribute to this increase or not? Um, and this is what it looks like if you control for pretreatment densities, 2013 and 14, in all these pastures, and then look at the densities in 2015, 16, and 17 after using pretreatment as a covariate, this is what we get. So absolutely no effect of our management on these densities. It's just been a weather effect. We've been going through a wet cycle and things are great. If we didn't have controls, I feel pretty certain that people would be like, yes, our management's working and western wheatgrass is better. Um, but this is the value of experimentation in adaptive management. So trade-offs in managing for multiple ecosystem services. First of all, what we've seen so far is we have a direct trade-off between two services. Our rested carm pastures supported, based on our best estimates at this time, me and the graduate students are still arguing over this number statistically, but I estimate 598 more grasshopper sparrows relative to the traditional pastures in 2016. And the traditional uh, system produced 7,960 more pounds of beef in 2016. So that means habitat for one grasshopper sparrow cost us 13.3 pounds of beef. And if we put that in numbers, habitat for one grasshopper sparrow cost us $14.01. I had one of our collaborators suggest, well, all we need to do is sell a card at the checkout at, at Whole Foods, and hey, you can buy a grasshopper sparrow for $14. <laughs> and then we'll just pay that to the ranchers and they'll, they'll do this. But um, so th we, we've at least got some idea of that there is a trade-off here. But of course, um, other ecosystem services are likely to co-vary. It's not, a, not as simple as we think. But these other ecosystem services, even with four years of experimentation and, and intent monitoring, still have a lot of uncertainty. So first one, drought resilience. We're waiting for a drought to see if that alters the performance of this grazing system. Uh, soil carbon sequestration, we don't expect that to respond in a four-year time frame more on a decadal time scale, so we hope to, to measure that in the future. And others, other bird species, uh, we see grasshopper sparrows responding to our management in a wet cycle, but um, there are some biological reasons to think that some of the species, such as lark buntings, Colorado State bird, um, may respond positively in a dry cycle, and we just haven't had the chance to quantify that yet. And then we also have trade-offs between learning and doing. So I'll try to walk you through this graph. Uh, this was made by my, one of my colleagues, and I, I really like the idea that it's trying to show here is, if we want to learn something, it, how we did make decisions to change our management in adaptive management really affects what we can learn in the future, but it can also affect what we achieve. And so the trade-off I'm looking at here is learning about drought resilience versus actually producing more pounds of beef. So imagine we're right here, and the purple here is representing how much we learn about drought resilience of an operation, and the green is representing how much we learn about stock density, the effects of, of stock density. So we're right here, so we might, we have a decision to make. We've, we've got four years of bad cattle performance. Should we change our stock density and try something different, or should we stick it out, keep doing the same thing, and see and learn what happens in a future drought? 
So if we continue with our current trajectory, when we hit a drought, we think we're going to learn a whole bunch. Um, but if we change our management now, when we hit a drought, we're not going to learn anything about drought resilience. If we change our management here, we might learn about how changing stocking density in, operates in a drought. And we might also get more beef for the next several years. So we've actually had this discussion with the stakeholders. What do you want to do? And in this case, they chose this learning here over the more beef, they, including the ranchers. They were like, well, I really want to know what's going to happen in the future in terms of drought resilience more than I want to increase my beef production. So we're, going to, we're currently continuing on this trajectory for at least the next year, and we'll continue to have those discussions. But it's really interesting how complex some of these trade-offs trade are in the decision making. Um, so here at the end, I just want to comment on um, some of the things we've learned on the social science side. Again, um, this has been harder for me because I like to look at data and make graphs. Um, fortunately, I got to work with Maria and Haley, and they like to talk to people and make transcripts and think about how people think. So I think one of the things I learned that surprised me is in the first year of first several years of the discussions with stakeholders, even when we started getting data coming back in in 2014, after the 2014 growing season, we had data coming in. And some of that data was, in my mind, making clear statements about how the system worked. Many of those stakeholders, just, that, that wasn't important to them at that point. Just because they got a year of data that contradicted their mental model of how the system worked, they were still like using their previous experiences and their worldview in making decisions. So giving, even involving people in this experiment, giving them a decision-making role and giving them data still didn't lead to them changing their perspective on what was happening. What it did do is it made that those differences in perspectives apparent, transparent. Like we started realizing, okay, you think this is how it works and she thinks this is how it works. Like we started to see the transparency in the different worldviews, but we didn't, People weren't changing their views on things yet. This has changed as we move forward. I think it took three years. Once we got into year four and five, that's when the stakeholders got to the point where they were becoming more friends. They all knew each other as people instead of as members of an organ or representatives of an organization. And once we got into that years and years four and five, and people really got to know each other, that's when I think they were much more became more willing to accept. Okay, this data is saying something. I'm going to have to change how I'm looking at things because it's just not matching with what I expected. So I think that was interesting to me, just how long it takes for people to go from using what they previously knew to incorporating new information into how they think about things. I do think that the, the, the discussions that we have in the meetings and the interactions between people and the way they talk to each other and know each other now does make it much more likely that they will use the monitoring data that we're providing them in, um, in their uh, adjusting their mental model of how the world works. Um, another thing I, could, I think I've learned a lot about is this adaptive management loop. When we started the project, we'd always have this up. Here's our adapt, we're going to use adaptive management here. And here's our loop. And First thing we realized as a group uh, of the scientists involved is that after doing this for five years, we realized there is no such thing as a loop. By the time you get through an annual cycle of this, you're in such a different place than when, where you started that <laughs> the idea of, of closing the loop almost seems like, um, well, let me back, in, in, the, in the literature on adaptive management, you often see people uh, talk about, did we close the loop? That's a measure of success in adaptive management. So and what we mean by closing the loop is you design a, an act, um, a management action, you do it, you monitor it, you evaluate it, and then you adjust. This, if you close the loop, that means you actually use your, the, your information you got to adjust, assess, and change your design. And we've been doing that, but it's way more complicated than that. And so here's this, this diagram is uh, our version of the adaptive management loop that our research group put together after five years of, of implementing this project. So we call it the adaptive management spiral. It's a spiral because you are always going in some direction you didn't think you were going to go each year. 
Um, one thing is, this is much more complex over here. There are different levels. You know, design goals and objectives is a different level of decision making than selecting your actions. Um, but what I want to point out, two things about this process that I want to talk about. First of all is, is how we go through this, this part here. So, in this, here we got just this evaluate. But this evaluate process, I, I think it's really interesting. What, as a, sci as a, like a biophysical scientist, what I used to do is I would get a data set, and then I would go to my office, and I'd analyze it, I'd visualize it in various software packages, look at graphs, and think about the patterns there. And many times, there's lots of results in that data set that are not what I thought were going to happen. And then I have to like tell a story about why I didn't get that result. And, Finally, synthesize it down into a few graphs that really tell what was important about that data set. But I usually do that on my own, just sitting in my office, and then I write a paper, and then I put it out there. But um, so if I were, in the first couple years, I was just taking monitoring data, interpreting it myself, making graphs, and then showing graphs to the stakeholders. And that's not what leads to like co-produced learning. Um, at this point, we're at the point where I still have to synthesize, I still have to uh, distill things down to some extent because there's no way we can as a group sit there and look at raw data sets. So I have to uh, distill it down to some level that I can present it to the group and we can have a discussion about it. But it's really the discussion of the data and now in our meetings we actually have discussion, well if you graph it this way or if you change that or if you bring in this covariate, what happens? And allowing to ha that discussion to happen with the stakeholders I think is, has been really helpful in terms of generating co-produced co knowledge. Um, and this, this encounter disorienting dilemmas, what I mean there is they have to take this data and say, oh, wait, it's just Cattle weight gains went down, okay. Sure they went down, yeah, here's the data. Okay, they went down, how am I gonna interpret this? What other data sets or what other monitoring do I need to help me interpret why that's happening and what I need to do next with my management? So it's this encountering the disorienting dilemmas as a group that I think has been a really big part of uh, collaboration and, and co-produce knowledge and then struggling with that complexity and un uncertainty in some way as a group. So I think a really hard part of adaptive management is as when you're when you're with a group of people again you're never going to be able to talk discuss or look at raw data sets together but you also can't be just looking at graphs that are ready to be submitted to a journal together as well. There's an intermediate phase that has to be done together to really get people to believe the results and, and take ownership of them. Okay, and then what else did I want to say? The other thing we learned a lot about, I think, is time lags. Um, most, in most cases, when we're doing adaptive management in any kind of natural resource setting, we have multiple goals. If you only have one or two goals, then it's easy. You, that's fine. But if you have more than two goals, or more than two specific objectives, it's going to get complicated fast. Uh, and one example for us is the rate at which we learn about different objectives. So I'll show you red. Is red lines are going to represent learning about cattle. And when we, this is our, this is our spiral here, right? So this is where we are right now. We we're getting some data coming in, and now we're going to have to think about what are we going to do next year. Um, well, back four years ago, when we implemented the first year of treatments, within one year, right at the end of the grazing season, we weighed every, every steer in the experiment, and we knew exactly how much weight all those animals gained, and we knew exactly what our outcome was for cattle. So we learned very fast. And then by year two of the experiment, we had two years of very detailed data knowing what happened. And so um, we learned very quickly about what was happening with the cattle. But when it comes to learning about plants, usually when we implement a, uh, an activity, it takes at least two years. So we've got to graze for a year and then measure the result in the next year. And for most of these long-lived perennials, you're not even expecting a result in the second year. You're looking at a result maybe coming out in three or four years. So with the, the plants, uh, we are just now finally here we are just finally beginning to make conclusions about the outcome of our management four years ago. So we've had a real delay in making conclusions. And then learning about birds has been even slower. Um, we're still struggling to make final conclusions about some of these, how some of these species uh, have responded to our management back in 2014 and 2015, now that we're here in January, February of 2018. 
So these time lags and how fast you learn really complicate the process. And again, there's this, this uh, I think again, illustrates how it is a spiral. <laughs> it's, there's these cross year interactions between different objectives that really complicate your decision making. Okay, so I, I put together two short talks into one longer talk, and I, I'm going to end it there. Uh, I think I just want to point out that the major funding sources for this, USDA NIFA, and also the site where we're working now is a long-term agroecosystem research site. Um, for those of you that haven't heard of it, there used to be the LTER program that was run here at CSU. Uh, but now we've started, uh, USDA has started a long-term agroecosystem research network across the country, and this experiment and this site is, is a member of that network, and that's what's funding most of what I showed you here today. And I just also want to thank, you know, just acknowledge the time that everybody's been putting into this from the stakeholder side, uh, particularly the ranchers that are involved, because they don't get paid to come to these meetings. Um, this is Rachel Murph, who's the state range con for NRCS. And Andy Lawrence, um, really impressive rancher who can both run a field day and take care of his grandson at the same time. <laughs> um, and that's all. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, well, so we've run, we have funding for the first five years, which we're finishing up this year, 2018, and then um, we are currently resubmitting a request for the next five years to, it's, it's mostly been hard funded by I ARS, and we're on a five-year funding cycle, so we're pretty confident that we will get it funded for the next five years, so we can run it for 10. I, I think they're going to get bored after that, and we're going to have to come up with something new. The second question is, um, <laughs> Uh, the graph was very interesting about this learning curve, you know, increasing. If these ranchers, those who are working with you, have this previous bad experience with the trial, you know, influence them to increase this, you know, uh -huh. to follow this line, or is it this project that actually helped them to be curious enough? And to no, I think it's the first one. Yeah, all these ranchers have been through several droughts at least. Okay. Um, most of them are multi-generational, so their parents have been through additional droughts, and you know, most of them, their families have been through the, the Dust Bowl. So drought issues are a really big issue in terms of uh, you know, economic viability of a ranch. So they're really interested in learning about maintaining more constant cattle numbers and not having to cut so drastically in drought years. Yeah. So with the beef, um, with, with, the, with the with the beef? With the beef, okay. Less weight gain and obviously less production. But has there been any difference with the quality? I'm talking about marbling or We don't we don't measure that. Again, these aren't our cattle, so they're owned by the ranchers and they go to feedlot in October. Um, so we have like six different providers, and some of them are owned in feedlot, and some of them the feedlot's buying. It's way too complicated to follow them. What we are going to do is, uh, starting next year, we, a subset of the steers are going to come from the meat animal station in Nebraska, where they know the full genetics of the, of the cattle herd there. So they're going to be providing us with a small number of yearlings that we'll put in both treatments. And then we'll be able to send them back to them to their feedlot after running them here and then get all the carcass data when they're slaughtered. And that will be nice because, again, we've got genetic issues with six different providers. Um, but there we will be able to test for any differences um, in carcass quality while controlling for genetics. So that'll be, I'm excited to do that. Yeah. A uh, couple things uh, for this and any future questions, would you? Please repeat for the benefit oh, of yes, those. Yes. It's okay, no, no trouble. <laughs> uh, I noticed, Dr. Augustine, that in some of your documentation for some of your meetings and such, you plan prescribed burns. Yes. Any burns administered? And uh, if not, do you anticipate that will change any of the outcomes? Okay, so that's another whole can of worms. <laughs> um, so. 
So one thing I want to say, and I'm not sure if I said this during the talk, but on that traditional side, anytime the stakeholders change the stocking rate each year, we also change it on the traditional side because we're really interested in isolating the effects of cattle rotation. What are the effects of cattle rotation? So we're keeping stocking rate constant on both sides of this, but the stakeholders get to decide what it is. The other thing that was brought up was what other forms of management should we be engaging in to achieve our outcomes? And fire and herbicide for cactus control were the two that were discussed the most. Um, we have been implementing burns because there is the recognition that one of the bird species of conservation concern pretty much only breeds on burns or prairie dog colonies and they already decided to exclude prairie dogs from the experiment which left kind of put them in a corner while well, you're going to have to do some burning if you're going to manage for this bird. So that was a really interesting process because there's deep cultural uh, concerns in the ranching community about prescribed burning and a lot of the conservation organizations are very interested in using it. So what we said is you, you can use these but if you decide to apply it to this CARM treatment, any herbicide or fire, then we're also going to apply it in the equivalent way to the traditional management pastures so we're still keeping cattle rotation as our single variable that we're isolating in the experiment. So we're not studying fire in an experimental way that way, but they have decided in several years to apply fires. We ha uh, we're doing small fires in some of the pastures and uh, there's been a lot of arguments about it. So the first year they all agreed, okay, let's do a couple burns. Second year the ranchers came back and said, I just don't like that. This is what I was saying about the world view. I came back after the first year and presented data showing that the burns increased forage quality. The cattle graze more intensively there than anywhere else. They liked the burns. And the bird species we were worried about showed up and nested on the burn. And then the next meeting, the ranchers all decided, we don't want to burn again. And that was really just them coming to it from their, you know, not using that information. They were coming to it from a, their personal experiences elsewhere outside the experiment. It took about three years of having these discussions to where they started to actually say, okay, well, I'll, let's try another burn. And then they'd see the results of, okay, so now we, we, we regularly usually do one or two burns a year. Uh, and I think that is one area that we've had that, that co-learning just to, took a while. Thanks. Yeah, in the back. I'm just kind of curious, what, what are some of those concerns that those ranchers may have expressed about the, the prescribed burning? Like, do they have any specific instances that they're like, this is what I'm afraid of? Or so the questions like what are the concerns about prescribed burning in the ranching community? I think the main thing is just how I, I didn't recognize how big of a deal drought is to them. And when you burn, all they see is that you've burned up a bunch of residual forage that they might need if we do run into a drought in the future. So it's just that risk factor. Like they really like the idea of grass banking because you're saving up residual forage that can help you in a future drought. But then if we take a portion of that and burn it off, they're just like, how stupid is that? Um, and there's this other perspective from the conservation organization like, well, that residual, maybe it'll help you out a little bit. So if you burn 10% of it, what's, you know, and you get these bird responses that you want, you know, why on earth wouldn't you burn? So those are the two opposing perspectives. Yeah. I think. Uh, so, we've talked a lot, a lot about what sort of the ranchers uh, learned after a while from you guys, from the scientists, but you sort of just alluded to something about what did you guys learn from the ranchers? Yeah, great question. What did we learn from ranchers? I think a lot of things. Um, we learned a lot about how they think <laughs> that I never knew. And I think also um, there were a number of things, um, ideas about how to use cattle behavior. We, we, we now use cattle behavior as part of the triggers for when they need to move to the next pa pasture and they gave us some input on that, like not just making it vegetation based. Um, and I guess just the whole perspective on stock density as well. There's a lot, there's variability among them, some thinking that putting them in this big herd was a great idea and some thinking that it's just too large of a herd and their experience is that if we bring it down to a lower, st you know, maybe two or three herds instead of one large herd that we would meet with more success. And so that just bringing in their perspectives. More success in terms of weight gain? Yeah, in terms of weight gain, yeah. 
Yes. Um, okay. It looks like the best results of this collaborative area is having the uh, more heterogeneous, heterogeneous species compositions. Can you tell us, um, can you elaborate a little bit more about, in terms of, let's say, um, for the forbs or for the grasses, the heterogeneous? Yeah, That's, uh, so the question is, in terms of this achieving heterogeneity goal, what have been the responses of other species like forbs? Yeah, like yeah I, we have a lot of data on that, and I have not looked at it. <laughs> um, one of the things, that is one, of, uh, we have more data than we could ever have time to discuss or you know, evaluate in meetings. Um, as a cursory, I don't think there's been much response just in terms of what we're seeing when we're out there, but I haven't done a thorough analysis of heterogeneity and species composition. What we've started with is just looking at heterogeneity in vertical and horizontal structure of the vegetation because that is believed to be more uh, important to bird nesting than the actual species composition. But I would like to look at that. Um, I suspect that there's differences in, in spatial distribution between the two treatments, but when you average across them, the four pop composition is similar. Yeah. Has this model, for, so you guys have been working on this for quite some time, have anybody, are there any other research stations or other um, groups approach you guys who want to try this on a, like a completely different landscape, say out? farther west or back towards the east, have anybody else like approach you guys to try to replicate this at a different landscape level or at a different, at a different area? So the question is, have other groups approached us about trying to replicate this model? Um, I don't think this is entirely new. I mean, there are a lot of collaboratives in the, in the western U.S. related to forestry. Uh, many of them have done some somewhat similar processes. I think what's really unique about the ours is that the stakeholders actually get to make decisions about what happens. Most of the collaboratives on public land, you get a group of people that advise a decision maker, but that decision maker can still veto the stakeholders if he wants. But this one, we gave them full control, so they can, whatever they decide goes. Um, so I think that is a different model. I haven't seen that applied anywhere else um, on public lands, personally, maybe it has. Um, we have been working with NRCS and we're thinking about trying to apply something like this to the EQIP program in Nebraska. So we have a CIG proposal in where it would be more collaborative decision making in terms of how EQIP funds, for those of you who know NRCS and how those funds work, applying those um, through a collaborative instead of the way it currently works where a rancher comes in and meets with an NRCS representative and says, I want to do this on my ranch and here's how I think we should do it and the two of them talk. We'll be bringing in a larger group to discuss it and doing it in a collaborative, uh, adaptive process. So we're hoping that'll go through, but it requires some fundamental changes in how NRCS operates as well. You showed at the end kind of that lag in the different um, kind of responses in your, in your management. And I was curious, so like the yeah. cattle, you learn something every year, the vegetation is three or four years. At what time scale are the decisions made? It seems like the decisions made more on the annual time scale in response to cattle production versus vegetation. Is that the way yeah. it works or not? Yeah. I mean, I didn't, I didn't want to bore you with all of the, the details of what we decide on. But you know, each year, it's a pretty much an annual cycle, but each year we can adjust how we do the rotation in terms of what triggers are we using to move cattle between pastures, where are we starting, and, and we, so those, those I would consider like very small incremental changes. And those we've been making all along. How fast should the rotations be? And, and trying to adjust those to do a better job. And also we've learned a lot about where they need to be in different early season, mid season, and late season in order to achieve some of our goals. But those are like short, right? And then you have the longer, the bigger decision has been like, should we change the stock? Tip? Should we split it into two herds or four herds? instead of rotating it as this one single herd. Uh, and that seems like a much bigger step. And that's so, that's where people have really wanted to see more data and more years before they're willing to 
to make that change. But it, that's to me, that's the big struggle, right? In adaptive management, is like, when do you just go with small changes versus bigger changes? And then the other thing we're doing is finally what the Maria calls the triple loop learning. This is. Um, where you actually think you've learned enough about the system that you need to change your objectives. And so we are doing that now too. We're in the process of revising our objectives, but that's, that's a real challenge too. Uh, we find that we run out of time for that almost every meeting. We try to get into it and then it's just very long discussion because it's an even higher level decision than the changing the stock density. So it took us four years of implementation to get to the point where we said we should start thinking about changing the objectives. In terms of the internal dynamics and the collaboration, have you all learned anything about how decisions are made in those contexts in terms of using sort of consensus rules to make decisions and sort of how those processes evolve? throughout the project? Yeah, we didn't define it very clearly. So this the question is, how, what have we learned about the decision-making process and, um, and the rules for decision-making, yes? So at the beginning, we didn't define it very clearly, and it was, I think we all assumed that we were in a consensus mode. And then in, before we actually got it going, uh, in the end of 2013, we did realize, okay, we need a very clear definition of how decisions are gonna be made. And so we had a discussion of it. We agreed on a supermajority. You know, we'd strive for consensus, but we had a supermajority rule if not everyone agreed. You had to have a supermajority, I think it was 70%, and we defined a quorum and all that. So we had a specific way of making an official decision. Um, in terms of, the other thing we've struggled a lot with is how to facilitate meetings. Um, I, because I'm often presenting the monitoring data, I get stuck being up in front a lot, and I'm a terrible facilitator. Like, I don't have, I've never been trained in facilitating, and we've realized that that's a really big part of it. So we've tried to t take that on more explicitly. We ha have hired a facilitator for one of our meetings, and that did not work well because you need somebody who is both has facilitation skills and knows a lot about the ecosystem that you're managing. And if you only have one or the other, it's, the meetings don't go well. But yeah, the, those skills of making people feel like they're being heard and they're allowed to talk and all that is very important in the discussions. <laughs> yeah, Anna. So in our current project that you and I have uh, beginning, I'm curious how our idea of including ranchers in the study process and the design actually helping to collect the data, how that you might see could have or would Yeah. Make things go faster or better or so the question is, would it have helped to have the stakeholders involved in data collection? Is that right? Yeah. So one of the things that we don't have here is, my, I, I supervise a team of technicians that collect all the data. So the the stakeholders are not doing that. They're, they are invited out. We usually have a day to day in the summer where they come out and we'll just work with data and then we'll go out in the field and look at all the pastures. Um, and we do sometimes do field trips at other meetings. So they get out and see things. We also send them an email every week during the growing season, just pictures of where the cattle are, what's happening, what the vegetation looks like, that kind of stuff. And some of them live, I mean, the ranches are all next door. So they have an idea of what's going on as well. Um, but they're not collecting the data themselves. That is an important point, because there is a, this argument that when people collect data, they're more likely to believe it, right? Um, I think it would help, but I, I just, I, when, when you're working with ranchers, these guys don't have a lot of time. I think that makes sense if you're working on their ranch, but asking them to come somewhere else and take time out, it's already, we're already asking them to come to meetings, and I, I think it would push them to the point where they wouldn't participate, is what I feel. So I think, you know, what, what we might try with some of our research in Wyoming Thunder Basin is, um, in that case, we're working with ranchers, with their cattle, you know, getting them to weigh their cattle, that's easy. And they all come, the ranchers all come when we weigh cattle. So they're, collect, they're there collecting that data. But the vegetation and the bird, no, they're just having people come and tell them what's happening. I think it would help, but I just don't think people have the time. Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious, 
So I saw dispersion as an indicator and that your GPS collaring a lot of the cattle. Have you seen any kind of behavior um, changes in the cattle about foraging and dispersion or cohesion um, over time? Yes, okay, so the question is, what have we seen in terms of cattle behavior. distribution and foraging behavior? Yeah, that's what I'm most interested in. Um, but usually people don't care about that, so. Really yeah. <laughs> um, so what we have seen is, yeah, it has given us some insights to the weight gain results. So like I said, we collect uh, fecal samples weekly to look at their diet quality, and the, the carmed cattle consistently have lower diet quality, particularly in terms of protein content in their diet compared to the traditional. So it suggests that the, these cattle at a lower stock density are able to forage more selectively and avoid getting standing dead in their diet. And that goes with the collar. So the GPS collar data, what we see is um, the traditionally, the, the, the cattle in the small herds are foraging in much more tortuous pathways, which is consistent with them probably just being more selective and taking their time with their bites, whereas the, when they're in that big herd, they're just foraging on an almost straight line in most of their grazing bouts because they have other animals around them, and that's why they're getting a lower quality diet. So it's just questions about, okay, so what's the herd size at which they, it would allow them to disperse enough to be sufficiently selective to increase that, that diet quality? And we haven't figured that out yet. One more question? Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering if you're familiar with Vicky Dreitz, who's work up in Montana. Um, she, I had a good friend who was a master's student under her, was looking at songbird, um, was looking at songbirds under rest rotation and then also under season long grazing patterns, and they found that actually having the mosaic of the two seemed to be most beneficial for higher bird diversity in that area. And I was just wondering, you can speak to any of that in the system yet, or if the results are still a little too far. Yeah, I saw, I saw they published a paper. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what it said, though, so I'm glad you know. Um, that makes sense, just because when you have the two management regimes, you're going to have a, more diversity of con a higher diversity of conditions. I think if you know what the birds are looking for, uh, particularly the species that are your target management species, you're better off targeting those conditions. But if you don't know, then yeah, hedging your bets would involve having both as many management regimes out there as you can produce. So that makes sense. Um, I, in terms of this, I don't think there's any bird species that are of conservation concern that are associated with this traditional management regime because most of the species that are of concern are out on the ends in terms of either really intensively grazed habitats or where they breed or really lightly grazed habitats or where they breed. And, and those are two rare things on the landscape because as a rangeland management community, we really don't like to overgraze places and we really don't like to undergraze places. And that's, I think, part of the basis of why these species habitats are missing in the landscape. Yes. We've reached our time limit. Thank you very much to everyone that came today. Please uh, join me in thanking Dr. Augustine for his excellent presentation.